Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, my name is Dr. Ankar Singh. Uh, today I'm going to be sitting down with uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Angela Hanlon. So thank you for taking time uh, to sit down with me. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Uh, Love in the green. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, it looks very good. Looks very good. Um, let's start with how long have you been in practice uh, as a naturopathic doctor? So I got licensed in November of 2008, so we're coming up on the 10 year mark, which is pretty exciting for me, but unfortunately I can't call myself a new ND anymore. I don't have any excuses anymore. <laughs> yes, no you can. Yeah, so that this is a great milestone, so congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, before we get right into the topic uh, that I know that everyone is totally interested in hearing about, um, what got you interested in, into this profession? Well, into the profession itself, uh, actually my aunt probably was my biggest inspiration. She was almost housebound uh, with allergies and autoimmune problems, uh, diet problems, and she was really, really sort of becoming victimized by her own body. Uh, and naturopathic medicine really helped her. So I was inspired to get out there and learn more about it, and I somehow ended up at the college and somehow ended up getting licensed. Yeah, it was a really cool journey. That's amazing. And I know the natural by the community and all your patients are grateful that uh, you are an ND. And I, I find a, a lot of naturopaths that I speak to, there's always uh, one or two major sources of inspiration. So it's great to hear that story. Um, today's topic is optimizing resilience and strength in muscle and joints. Um, and I know for you personally, you deal a lot with chronic pain. Um, chronic pain is a common concern among many patients that we see, and you see a large part of your patient base with these concerns. So first question, Dr. Hanlon, is what are some of the things you personally do in your clinical practice to deal with chronic pain? Well, first and foremost, it's extremely individualized, more than I thought that it ever needed to be. Uh, this was very much a trial and error uh, through the years to learn uh, quite a bit more than what I was taught. And so my patients have really been um, really excellent teachers for me. So along the way, um, I've been able to learn that some people need a little bit more of an assertive, strong technique. And others need an extremely gentle technique. Some people need me to do a lot of work. And some people actually need to do the work themselves and where I guide them. Mm -hmm. And so um, it really is, is about, and that's where the conversation comes in in the beginning, is to really help the person um, and for me to understand how that person's body responds to challenges. That gives me a lot of insight as to what type of hands-on therapy that I'm going to be using with them. Mm, very interesting. And I love how you said that for uh, some patients, you know, you're guiding them and you're sort of leading them, whereas others based on your assessment, they have to take charge and ownership and, and that must take a lot of skill to be able to know uh, which individual is going to fit sort of which um, category, if you will. Thank you. <laughs> um, you hear about this uh, term overtraining syndrome, like I never thought that could be such a thing, like, you know, you're overtraining, but I, I've been hearing more about this. and. Um, what are your thoughts on this and what, what is overtraining syndrome and what are maybe the downsides of that? Well, overtraining syndrome is a version of burnout and everyone's heard of burnout. Uh, most of us have heard of adrenal fatigue and it's not quite adrenal fatigue. There's a few differences there, but when it comes to overtraining syndrome, it just looks different in the literature, really. So um, you're going to see an elevated resting heart rate okay. and that's your call sign. And so if you're someone who's really competing and really wanting to perform optimally, but really protect your body, um, you want to start checking your heart rate beats per minute here yeah. or here yeah. every morning before you get out of bed. And okay. that'll be your benchmark as to making sure that your body is staying resilient and protected through high training times. But overtraining syndrome doesn't have to happen just with the really elite competitive athletes. Um, it's going to happen with some of the beginners as well because what can contribute to overtraining syndrome is our life. Mm -hmm. So when we start to um, do a workout, it can get frustrating for people because we're supposed to have better energy, better mental clarity. We're supposed to be able to uh, balance our weight, whether that's weight gain or weight loss, whatever we're, we're, our goals are. We want to be achieving those goals. Um, overtraining syndrome is going to really inhibit that because you, what you see with overtraining syndrome is um, oftentimes you'll have a resistance to weight loss or you might even gain weight and that your performance actually decreases. And so your race times or your lifts or whatever are not going to be improving 
when they should and that you're actually going to get a lot of mental clarity problems and even problems articulating your words through your your work day or through your family day so um you know it's one of those things that you have to watch out for um in addition to overtraining uh, in addition to some of those other things um overtraining syndrome has been linked to uh, repeat strain injuries and so we think that actually if you're doing too much you're actually um, increasing your risk of getting an injury mm. and we do see that right in our practices so you made an interesting comment that one would think that when you hear overtraining syndrome okay it's going to affect the elite athletes those who are serious the marathon trainers etc but you're also saying that this can affect those who are starting to get into like a fitness program or an exercise program the beginners so what piece of advice or pieces of advice would you give to someone who's just starting to exercise and knows obviously it's an important thing to do. So how would you sort of guide them or what pieces of advice would you give so that they potentially avoid getting into those types of situations? So if you're just starting out a workout regimen or if you're starting a new maybe upper level regimen um, that's kind of bigger, um, number one, like don't just zone out. Don't be watching the TV and thinking about your stuff and planning and just kind of blindly doing your workout. Be present with yourself. Listen to your body. Mm -hmm. Watch your body. Mm -hmm. Watch your breath. Are you really winded that day? Mm -hmm. um, things are going to fluctuate day to day. Your performance is going to fluctuate day to day and that's normal. So if you're more winded or not as strong one day, it mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean overtraining syndrome. Okay. But it does mean that you want to be watching for that. Hmm. Again, resting heart rate in the morning is so easy. It takes 10 seconds. Well, 30 is more accurate. Yeah. <laughs> 10 if you're super busy and rushing. <laughs> yeah. um, and of course, hydration levels are super important. Mm -hmm. Now, my patients, um, I find, are definitely, most of them are really well hydrated. They're, they're drinking two to three liters of water a day. So I don't have to have those conversations with them. Mm -hmm. For some of them, what I have to have a conversation about is actually salt intake in that they're actually not having enough salt. Hmm. And so it's one of those things where you have to find your own balance. And sometimes it's a matter of the, the simple things being approached intelligently. So it is actually quite helpful if you're doing a big change in your life in any regard, especially in this regard, to have some guidance to make sure someone else is watching out for you as well. So a professional um, in particular and someone hopefully who is not pushing you, pushing you, go, 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 push hard, 110%. I'm not someone who, I'm very cautious about, about um, people who are trying to push too hard when you're at the gym training. Mm. No, that makes a good point. And, and I guess what, what I'm gathering, uh, at least among all the other points I'm gathering from what you just said, is that it is important to observe and listen to your body and the signals that your body is giving, right? Um, and that will be part of um, not in a sense sabotaging your whole exercise program, right? So you're always, as you said, being in tune that if you're noticing something is um, hurting or you're in pain um, and it's persisting, you don't want to overdo that exercise or that component of your fitness program and get the attention that you need and work with someone like yourself who's going to sort of guide them in the most appropriate way. Exactly. Yeah. Could I add to that as well? Of course, yeah. Um, the body has its own language, mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily speak English or whatever language you speak. Um, it speaks visuals, and so what you're going to get is information coming in through your imagination. Um, and that's going to be the best source of information from your body. And that may seem a little sort of out there, but, but when you think about it, um, a lot of people will describe their pain in metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, when people come to see me and I rehabilitate them, um, what I will do is make sure that they have a skill set and that they have learned the language of the body. And so I'm actually teaching a language when I'm, I'm teaching people skills and self-care. I'm, when I'm doing a hands-on, I'm showing them and I'm talking to them. And I'm talking through that a lot. I do a lot of talking and I do a lot of asking. It's very interactive. And so by the time our therapy sessions are complete and they can do their own self-care and manage their problems on their own, and hopefully there's no problem left, um, they have the warning signs that they can now recognize that maybe they didn't they weren't recognizing before as warning signs they're able to listen to their body have a conversation with the body um in a way that is going to is going to actually work it's very interesting um my next question is and i realize this is sort of a very broad question so feel free to just kind of give some key points 
How does nutrition and lifestyle relate to staying strong and resilient from a musculoskeletal perspective? Well, there are many different nutrients and there's many cascades of chemical processes that happen in a flex and release situation for your muscles, let alone lubrication of the joints, integrity of the cartilage, integrity of the bones, integrity of your fascia and all your fluids that you need to lubricate everything. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that goes on. There's circulation stuff, there's blood stuff, right? And so there's nutrients that we need to have carried in our blood to give us enough energy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna shout out any just now, but definitely nutrients for that. There's specific nutrients that um, the, muscle can, the muscle can flex on its own, but it needs certain nutrients to actually release that flexion and go back to a state of neutral, which is zero flexion. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's going to stay in mid-flexion and it's going to cause a shortening in those muscles. Those two muscles that it's attached to, are gonna, those two bones are going to come closer together and you're going to have limited range of motion. Your joints are going to compress, cartilage issues, arthritis type of issues eventually, and there's a cascade of things that happen when a muscle is stuck in mid-flexion. Mm. So there's loads of nutrients um, that come into play with that, and it's not even just our basic vitamins and minerals. Sometimes it's uh, phytonutrients and those types of things, and that should be getting into fresh foods as well. Um, was that too broad? Do you want me to get more specific? No, I, I think you make a good point. I mean, there is no magic pill, as they say, right? But yeah. um, And among all the sort of list of different um, important nutrients for everything that you said, it is important that an individual is working with a practitioner because then you're able to sort of get a sense and assess what is sort of the right plan for you, right? Um, not everyone's going to have to do glucosamine sulfate, for example, right? Um, so it, as you said, um, it, it's, it's more of zoning in and, and really trying to understand that unique individual, right? But we do know that nutrition obviously is going to play a very important role. Um, as is like certain lifestyle factors, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, I've heard of this technique called guided muscle self-release. And I know you do this in your practice, so can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that's a neat one. Um, that one's not as well known and there's very little tiny bit of literature on this. Um, we need to get more literature on this. So basically, the people who respond best to guided muscle self-release um, are the people who are in a state of sort of gripping and defensiveness and so they're almost they're bracing themselves through their day I'm gonna get to give you a visual of someone who's high whiplash mm -hmm. So they've been in a fender bender their head went like this and back and they went back Right in that state oftentimes with whiplash you'll notice that you're not gonna get symptoms right away mm -hmm. the headaches the stiffness the locked up the nausea the uh, stress comes in three to four days later, maybe a week later, and it starts to worsen, 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 worsen. And it's kind of mysterious how it does that, right? What's going on? That's the brain and the, sort of the reflexive part of the brain, maybe not our logical part, but maybe somewhere back here, we have a reflexive part of our brain that is feeling threatened and that it needs to protect us. And that reflexive part of the brain doesn't know when we're in a car or when we're just resting or when we're at our computer, it doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. So it has to go, well, if that happened once, it could happen again. I better brace myself all the time. Mm -hmm. So with guided muscle self-release, you're consciously through here using your imagination, your visuals to speak to the rest of your body and give it directions to release that muscle tension. So it's very, very, very detailed skill building for very specific muscle groups. Mm, it's does interesting. that make sense? It does, it's interesting. I mean, definitely what you're doing is very unique, right? And, and, I, and I think, uh, yeah, I'm finding this very all, all interesting and fascinating. Um, acupuncture is something else that I know um, all NDs are trained and licensed to do, but it's a large part of your practice, as is cupping. Yes. Um, and this kind of will um, bring us to sort of the close of this interview, but. Um, how often do you use acupuncture and or cupping in your practice in uh, for, the, for these situations? <laughs> yes, uh, everybody's different. Um, some people are not comfortable with acupuncture and we can definitely do lots without it. But um, in a lot of cases, especially acute cases, injuries, pulling a canoe over, over your head and this goes, you know, that sort of thing. Acupuncture and cupping are, are so, so helpful. So what I will do 
um, with my acupuncture and my cupping is that I'll prep the muscle. I do a series of sort of a sequential um, stretching and releasing and then kind of shaking it out and doing it again and kind of getting a lot of that out of there. Then cupping happens as a step two, which is basically, it's kind of, it's suction cups is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so it creates a suction and what it does is it accesses some of those deeper areas in the body that I wouldn't have access to with my hands. And instead of applying pressure, it's the opposite of pressure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so what it's doing is it's allowing that muscle, that space and opportunity to start to release on its own. And a muscle that's releasing is wiggling and shaking and trembling. Even if you're not noticing that, you're not going to feel it, but it is doing that. And so it just sort of wiggles its way back to neutral or partial neutral enough so that it's prepped and ready for me to do acupuncture very effectively. And with my acupuncture, it's more of it's what's called myofascial release acupuncture. Okay. Mm -hmm. So dry needling. Mm -hmm. It's not traditional Chinese medicine. I do that as well. You go into the certain part of the muscle and you encourage it to finish its flexion and release. So you get a twitch. It's a very fast thing. Mm -hmm. And you might have to do it a few times to get it to eventually calm down, settle and soften. Yeah, which I think we always, we also call like a trigger release as well. Right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And we know that acupuncture uh, is very effective for pain management. And is it for everyone like uh, cupping? Is it for everyone who comes in with pain? Are there certain patients that you may not, you might not consider doing cupping? Yeah. Um, some patients who are, uh, are actually, I've had patients coming in asking for acupuncture and cupping and it's not what the body needed. And so I've had to sort of to balance that because I, you kind of know that, but you do have to, you have to figure that out and you have to work with the patient. And so we try and it wasn't quite the right thing. And so we have to try a different technique next time. It's not for everybody. Absolutely not. Um, and there's, it's not for every body region either, either. Sometimes there's body regions I don't even bother with cupping and acupuncture because there's other techniques that work better. But I do, I do love those two techniques together. They, they are extremely effective and I'm very blessed to be able to use those tools. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. Yeah, th this was very interesting. Uh, even from my personal perspective, it kind of gave me a slightly different angle in terms of um, looking at chronic pain, right? And, and some of the summary points I'm gathering from you today are, you know, obviously the, um, uh, as, as we sort of are trained as naturopathic doctors to look at each person as a unique individual, you're reminding us, Dr. Hanlon, that um, we need to listen to our body, be present. I mean, that's a good thing to do in general. But especially when we are doing a fitness or exercise program, we, we need to be really in tune with our body. And, and it's good to have a, a, someone that you can work with who's going to guide you um, with the most appropriate treatment plan. So thank you once again. And um, for those of you watching, um, hopefully uh, you enjoyed some of our discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you.